you know, had I not made that decision and not done that, um, you know, I'd be in the predicament like a lot of people, but, you know, they would have sold me to somebody else inevitably because I'm part of, you know, whatever. And I would have never probably seen another dime from it, even though my music plays all over the world to this day. Today is Tuesday, October 1st, 2024. We're speaking with international singer, songwriter, producer, director, and attorney, <laughs> Joy Cardwell. Um, you were saying a great quote. We were at a time where the musicians are incidental, singers are incidental. Please go on. Yeah, I was I was saying um, as we were just getting started that, you know, we're at a stage in the game where music is incident incidental to the show. And the show has nothing to do with even, you know, it started with it started with the musician. Well, they say video killed the radio star, right? So talent took a, a, a sidestep to the visuals. Then you got new genres of music that came out that incorporated electronics into it. So you, you didn't need the skill set to really be a musician. Maybe if you were a vocalist, you still had an opportunity to be a top line person. But now even the DJs who had taken the craft of the recording artists have now been usurped by just production. I mean, we've seen it happen, you know, all over the place from that disastrous, what's a, Elon Musk's uh, girlfriend, uh, Grimes. Oh. Artist, oh, oh, oh. As that was a embarrassing. So maybe maybe as an artist she she has her own thing I don't really know but as a DJ like that wasn't even you know it was like well I don't need to be an artist because I can just press some buttons or play this pre-recorded set and just be on stage and have the rest of the lighting and all this other stuff just take over but you you see what happens when technology fails so that that's where we're at is in, in the state of, of music so to be able to still you know kind of hark back to the to good old days where you know, no matter what, if the power went out tomorrow, I'm going to be gigging <laughs> if I wanted to, because as a vocalist and someone who actually sings on key, you know, we have the opportunity. Um, to be she says sings on key. I caught that. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. But you know what I'm saying? It's like the, the whole the whole premise of talent at this point has just been kind of like just it's just disintegrated. And even if you have talent, real talent, you know, people just don't care. You know, they'll take it for five seconds and be like, that was great. Anyway, screw it, you know, and that's the world we're living in. So this is where we're at. <laughs> Tell us about your new single, What Becomes of You um, with Eden Prince. Um, who is Eden Prince? How did you meet them? Uh, tell us about this new song. Okay, so the new single is called What Becomes of You, and there's a backstory because you know there always is. Um, you know, obviously in the world and in the music business particularly, um, everything that we do is about connecting, right? Connections and connecting. So Joe B, you know, the famous, world famous Joe B, who I've known forever, promoter and marketing uh, music man, um, from New York called me up one day and says, hey, you know, I've got this kid from the UK that's really interested in working with you. I'm going to hand you off to his uh, manager. So basically, if it wasn't Joe B, I'd be like, who, what? Uh, you know, I looked him up and, uh, you know, he's 20 something years old. Um, cute kid, you know, looks like he's got something going on. Had been doing a couple of covers um, as his kind of foray into the music scene. And I liked what I heard. So I was like, all right, well, I'm open because I've always I've always had the um, the notion that I shouldn't only work with famous people, number one, because they want to charge you too much money and you're never guaranteed like an investment. You know, past performance is not indicative of future performance. So, you know, I never let anybody just sit on on that because I know what what it's like a fluke. Sometimes you you make hit records when you don't think you are going to. And the things you like the least end up being the hit record. So anyway, I was open to that. He sent me this track and um, it was called What Becomes of You. So I always really like when a producer or a writer um, sends me music with the title because, you know, embedded within that is already some, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's an intention there. And, you know, having an intention, even if it's just an idea, it's, it's a seed. And with that seed, I already have a sort a story that's waiting to be born. Right. So um, so we 
he sent me the track. I was like, wow, this is, you know, this has kind of got a little vibe to it. And I, I sat with it probably for a day. And um, I was like, what becomes of you? And instantly I was just kind of harking back to, for some reason, Lisa Stansfield and Rick Astley. Don't ask me why. That's just what it kind of gave me that vibe. And I was like, all right, well, this is kind of a British pop tune. This is what I'm, I'm kind of vibing with this. And it's got that house history like I can hear it you know within it so I just sat down with it and the next thing I know I just started writing the tune as I always do humming along and then I was thinking about my upcoming nuptials you know and it's like you know the hook kind of came out what what comes of me what becomes of you and that's really kind of it you know that's that's pretty much how the, I think my best songs have been written that happened with what it feels like with Quentin Harris it happened with Toa Te when I did Love Connection um you know things just kind of organically just came out of that. And and at this stage in, in my life, that's the only way it's going to work. If I'm not feeling it, unless you just offer me a crazy amount of money to just sing a tag, I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do it. But if I really truly want to write a song and do something as a collaborative effort, um, I'm just looking for freshness. I'm looking for things that interest me and, you know, just kind of move me. And then we just see what happens from there. So backstory to that, the first label that they presented to was Nervous Records. Now, if you know me at this point in, in, in my life, my answer to that was, hell, I'm not doing it. <laughs> That's a hell to the no. I'm not giving Mike Weiss a record just because um, he, amongst many people in this business, just have a habit of, um, you know, collecting music just to build their catalog. And, you know, on the on the flip side of that, their business practices just don't align with mine. You know, I, I like to work with people that I have a good history with. And so we ended up with King Street um, because I've done stuff with Hisa. I mean, I know Hisa sold the label, but I have a nice long history with Hisa um, Ishoka, who is the is and was the owner of King Street Sounds. And um, I figured this would be a better fit. And then with their new um, partnership with Armada, I was like, OK. We've got a European label, you know, conjoined with a New York label with a Japanese connection. I was like, this feels more like me, you know, we're going to do something. But the beautiful thing about um, working on this record, um, where Eden actually flew into New York and we recorded it. I respected that. Like I was, you know, I was like, okay, this, this young man is serious about his craft. He's serious about what he's doing. And, um, you know, I think that the so far the record's been doing, you know, rather well, because, you know, things, they come in for one week and they disappear. And we still have a lot of momentum going into ADE, um, which is, uh, I think it's coming up this week or next week. Um, and the fact that we have an actual marketing plan. Ch check it out. Like, you know, labels always tell you that, oh, we're going to have a marketing plan. But. They actually do, you know, they've been, they've been making sure that we have materials and they've been making us aware of radio play and who they're sending it to and, you know, keeping us abreast of what's happening and how we can tie into what they're doing, you know, and, and that's a breath of fresh air because it, it's more akin to, you know, the old school way of actually pr producing and building momentum on a record instead of just throwing it out like, you know, spaghetti against the wall and seeing if it sticks, so. I guess that is the big the big story about what becomes of you, how we got here, where we are today. Awesome. Thank you. That actually perfectly leads me into my next question. What has digital technology done for the development of house music? Do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages or vice versa? Uh, well, that all depends on what you call house music. <laughs> mm. um, you know, if you're talking about soulful house music, if you're talking about originator house music and by that i mean what came out of detroit chicago new york and new jersey um you know there was always the promise of what digital music what digital distribution digital um platforms would do for for house music and in some you know some ways of course it has helped us to maintain and, and actually monetize if you you know own it and keep it the longevity of it, of course, because we, you know, we came out of a vinyl perspective and vinyl and CDs and then digital bootlegs, et cetera. Um, so in some ways it's been very helpful for legacy artists such as myself to be able to 
you know, stay on playlists that are consistent, just like any other genre has, you know, oldies or whatever you want to call it. Um, on the other hand, electronic music or EDM, which now calls itself house, has also kind of bastardized, you know, what was something that was created and not meant to be, you know, black thing or anything like that, because it's always been international, but it's, it's definitely kind of um, diluted it to the point where nobody really even knows what house music is, what it represents, unless you get pigeonholed into something like, oh, it's soulful house or it's, you know, and then everything else that came out of that electronic dance music kind of subgenre. So hurt in some ways, because obviously you can't sell records. You, you're making what, one hundredth or a thousandth of a penny, something like that on a stream. Um, maybe it's a little bit more on other things. And if you are lucky enough to, you know, hit those thresholds where you're consistently being played, you know, you get a couple hundred dollars a month per song, if that. Um, but I also think that, you know, you got to go with the times, right? The piano roll was once the medium, then it was vinyl and that broke, then it was tapes and that didn't last. And, you know, people were always bootlegging and whatever. But I think, um, you know, long term, if we are going to have something that is continual, I think that the digital, um, I think there need to be some gatekeepers again. You know, I don't think, I think that, I think that we've gotten to a point where everybody can do everything has really diluted, you know, again, the art, artistic side of, of that. Like everybody can't do music. Everybody can't do it well. You know, there needs to be some sort of curation of what's quality and what's not just to the point that you know, people who are really doing this for a living and not as a hobby have an opportunity to sustain themselves. But you know, I mean, I'm I'm at the long end of this game, so you know, I've been lucky enough to have publishing and have master rights and things like that where I can still make money from it. But from the other perspective, some artists never got paid and still ain't getting paid. Can you describe the moment you first realized you wanted to pursue a music career? Oh, I was six years old. <laughs> um, yeah, I was six years old. My parents had, you know, the Columbia Music uh, Record subscription. You know, you pay $1 a month or something. Remember in the TV Guide, I don't know if you're old enough to remember this, but in the TV Guide, which was a printed magazine that came out weekly, there'd always be this page inside that said, for one penny, you know, we'll give you 10 albums and, you, you know, you pay this negligible um, thing. So they would also send these records that you didn't want, maybe, you know, to introduce as a marketing tool, you know, lost leaders to introduce people to new artists or whatever it was. So I would get my parents throw their throwaways and they were like, don't touch our stereo. They gave me my own little kitty stereo, like for real, had my own turntable with a little radio station and two speakers attached to it. And I would sit in my room as an only child and um, I would take all the instrumentals and write my own songs to it with my little RCA rec tape recorder and do my own thing. So I think that that was, you know, as soon as I could write, I was writing songs. And I, you know, I, I could write pretty well at six in first grade. So that's how I knew I wanted to be in the music business. And it didn't hurt that my parents had already put me in dance recitals. So I was already on stage at like three, four, five years old. So I wasn't afraid to be on stage. And then I had my own thing going on. and. You know, I mean, I listened to a tape of myself, which is now stuck in one of my tape recorders, but I couldn't really sing though. <laughs> I wasn't that good at it, but I had something, you know, and I just kept pursuing it. Choruses and citywide chorus and high school plays and things like that. And by the time I got to um, college, freshman year of college, I did Apollo, Amateur Night at the Apollo. And that was, that was it. I was on my way. Talk to us about performing at Carnegie Hall at five years old. Um, so there was a, a dance school that I went to in Queens and um, they would, you know, hire out Carnegie Hall and uh, Lincoln Center and all these different magnificent halls. And uh, I was one of, I was, I was cute as a kid. So I'm, I'm sure it was probably more the cuteness factor than my actual talent. Um, and I was selected to be uh, in this little, vignette called the three blind mice so I was one of the three blind mice I went on stage did some little cute dance and that was it so my debut Carnegie Hall you know and the rest they say is history but yeah from there I actually 
performed at Alice Tully Hall. I performed at um, the Beacon Theater singing uh, Minnie Ripperton's Loving You, um, I, you know, hitting those whistle notes at 13 years old. Um, you know, I did pretty much almost, I mean, I played in every major place other than Madison. I haven't done MSG yet, but, you know, I'm still on the bucket list. God willing and the river don't rise, we'll get there some kind of way. Um, but yeah, I played in all the major, you know, venues in New York by just serendipity. I think, you know, sometimes you you do wonder if your life is predestined, you know, or is it predestined within parameters that, that are put there and then you kind of play your cards and it just kind of opens that door. Like, oh, you opened door number one. You were successful at this level. Let's see what happens next. Because that's, that's how it seemed like, you know, my whole life, that's how things have kind of happened. You studied English and music at NYU. Mm -hmm. How did your academic background contribute to your songwriting? Um, yeah, I studied English, music, literature, and philosophy, right? So I went to the Gallatin School, which was um, the School of Individualized Study. Um, humanities were very much, you know, the curriculum where you, it, it was kind of like going to Brown, where you pretty much have a humanities kind of open curriculum where you can study whatever you want. So, um, because I had such, I, I'm so bad at math, number one, math and science, even though I went to Stuyvesant, which my mother made me do, even though I sucked at it. I don't know how I made it through that one semester I stayed there. Um, you know, reading and studying other cultures and just kind of being absorbed in, in different types of ways to express yourself was, I think, the, the impetus um, in, for my songwriting. Because I think you know, at the end of the day, a good songwriter is a storyteller, right? And I think that the best songs that last outside of whatever period of popularity that, you know, when we write within a genre, we write within the time frame of what exists at that moment, right? So, you know, Picasso and his friends were doing Cubism, we were doing house music, you know, or I was doing R&B, whatever it was, you kind of fit within whatever's contemporary. But if you strip away all of that, to any time period and you have a great song and a good melody, that's what makes things timeless. So I think that that background that I had and being open to having stuff last longer than the moment has always been key to use universal themes because you study these things, you realize that mankind has gone through the same thing over and over and over again. And all we're doing is looking at how we are in this state of being in this in this time and how do we frame that in a way that responds or resonates with you know the people of that era and you know if you if you stick to universal themes you're always going to be relatable tell us about answering that village voice ad that led to working with little lewis what was going through your mind <laughs> um okay so first time i answered an ad i ended up being in a girl group with kashif right so um right so i'll let me backtrack to that so i can kind of lead up into the little lewis thing so um backstage remember backstage it still exists but backstage was a newspaper that came out which was an entertainment casting like tip sheet and so there was a blind call to work with um kashif not revealing who he was, but that he had worked with Whitney Houston. And I was like, oh, okay. So the, the, the call said that, you know, this producer wanted dancers who could sing. And because I was a musician, I was like, no, nah, that's wrong. He wants singers who can dance. So I went to this audition and there was like, you know, 9,000 girls online who were all dancers. And I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. So I walked into that audition and I sang somebody else's guy at that audition. So before I got home, Kashifa called me, it was like, when, when are you gonna come back down and you know, you're in? Because I knew, you know, it was like, again, you know, reading is fundamental. It's like, I'm looking at a, a tip sheet from a producer and I was like, well, why would a record producer want dancers who can sing when it's a record producer? So, you know, just having keen insight and be able to read, you know, between the lines is how I got that first gig. Long story short, that didn't work out. You know, we did a whole album. Terry from In Vogue was in the group. Um, she moved on and ended up in In Vogue. Once that record came out, I was like, yeah, we're not putting out this. This record is mad corny compared to that. Because we were in that bubblegum pop into hardcore, you know, R&B at that point. So that happened. So uh, here I am, just finished this whole, worked on this album, this project for like two years or whatever. 
Um, and I come across the Village Voice, and once again, you know, I see this blind thing, and it was like Sony recording artist, and it was very mysterious. And I'm thinking, shit, Michael Jackson going to audition people for a tour, right? So it was Little Lewis um, who was doing this audition for his tour. He had put out French Kiss at that point, which no, I am not a part of French Kiss. I don't know why people somehow in my biography got that all messed up, but he had already done that record. And you know, French Kiss was a big record. So, you know, if anybody knows Lewis and people who probably are watching this knows that he's a bit of a quagmire, I will say. He's mysterious in his own mind. <laughs> you know, he's a special kind of person. So he's sitting behind a curtain. I'm like, I'm definitely sure this is Michael Jackson, you know, like hiding behind the curtain, talking through the speaker, you know, in that going, saying, Hi, um, can you, you know, sing something for us? So long story short, I did the same thing. I I I don't know what I sang at that point, but I I I did my thing. And um, I think that was on a Tuesday. By that Thursday, I was in Chicago, had written the song, Dancing in My Sleep, was flown to Chicago, recorded that with Lewis, and the rest, as they say, is history. You know, we're still still kind of fighting over that album, but, you know, it is what it is. It, without Lewis, you know, the, the, the thing is, without Lewis, I probably would never have been in dance music at all. Cause it wasn't even on my, it wasn't on my radar. I mean, I wasn't even, I didn't even like house music that much back then. I thought it was too simplistic. It was too repetitive. It was like, kind of just like, you know, like really, this is like, this is dumb music. It's just like, you know, people or people who are high, you gotta be high to do this. And I wasn't ever that high, you know, that, it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like that after hour of kind of like that, that space where people are just kind of locked into a beat and it's just, repetitive and that was not for me but um you know obviously the journey with the Al lonely album was more than that it was it was very musical and um that was a wonderful thing it's a shame you know that we didn't continue to work after that project but you know god is good all the time <laughs> club lonely and save my life became huge hits mm -hmm. how did that sudden success impact you personally and professionally um, you know, it's weird because success is a relative thing, right? So when Club Lonely was starting to blow up, um, I was, I had, I was a manager at Macy's working. I had gone through their executive training program and, um, you know, I didn't know if I was going to have a job in retail or whatever it was. I really, I really was just take, I took a job because at the time I had a partner who was like, you're a musician, like, really? How's that going to work out? And I had, I was like, it's going to work out just fine. You know, I've always managed to get on these tours and do other kind of stuff and, you know, like make major money, you know, working because I work with top level people. But anywho, I would be, um, I would be at, at Macy's in Staten Island doing my thing while in the storeroom in the back where they were unloading the trucks, you know, I'd be like, yo, you're working on the radio like right now. So I think I stayed probably at that job six months. That was all, that was probably, I think that was my last real like job, right? So I was there for six months, the record blew up. And the night that it went to number one, I actually quit the band, the very night, um, because Lewis was acting a fool. We were playing at the shelter, I believe. Um, and I think uh, we had just done a performance and they were like, hey, you know, your record, you know, is number one. And we were like, yay, you know, Lewis, like, we're going to have a meeting back at my place after this. And I was like, okay, cool, because we were ready to go start touring and doing this whole thing. And basically, um, I had my dad had come to the show. Now, anybody, again, who knows me has seen my dad around. He's always floating, you know, at different spots and, you know, WMC and things like that. So I went out to greet my dad in my hometown and whoever else came to see me. And Lewis was like, how dare you? How dare you? without my permission, you know, go out and talk to anybody. And I was like, Negro, please. First of all, nobody's going to tell me not to talk to my dad. But, you know, uh, and then, you know, other things transpired that night. Like he had cut me out of the, the the album shoot, the photo shoot for the album. Because remember, if you if you if you actually look at the album, it was Little Lewis in the World. So it was supposed to be like, what was Prince's band? You know, back in the day, it was like Prince and the New Power Generation. Right. So it was like that kind of Prince-ish 
kind of vibe or it was that's what it was sold to be. So we get home, we get to Lewis's home. The record has come out, um, number one record. Now here's the album art. He has taken my full name off the record and just, he's like, kind of like your name. You should be Joy Summers or something. I was like, but my name's Joy Cardwell. So if you look on the record again, so these are receipts, you know, not just whatever. It just says Joy on the record. So just kind of left it out there. And, and so the last thing that transpired was he told me he owned me. And that I couldn't do nothing without his permission. And I was like, you need to go back to Chicago because we don't do things like that here in New York. And guess what? I don't need you, Donda. I don't need you. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, good luck with your tour. Have a great time trying to do it. And so, you know, he's like, I'll just replace you. And I was like, okay, we'll see about that. And, um, you know, they tried it for, I think, I think they made it out to LA and I think they made it to San Francisco and, uh, yeah, a tour was canceled because he can't sing. And I was the voice. And my voice, you know, is my voice. I have a very unique voice. So um, so that, you know, the record that was a big hit could have been a much bigger hit had he not been crazy. So when people think, you know, like, oh, everybody knows Club Lonely, this thing, there was no guest list tonight. Everybody knows that song. As soon as you say it, it's, you know, it, it's... It hits you, hits you the same way as, you know, um, she's homeless or, you know, or uh, finally, like we were, those were all of the songs of that era that we were right there neck and neck, you know, all of that was happening. And had Lewis not shot himself in the foot, that record, which thank God, again, the music speaks for itself, um, you know, instead of it being a hit, but also kind of like underground edge hit it would have been much bigger because we had the machine behind us. We, we had everything going for us, but I just was like, um, yeah, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to work with a, a misogynistic, perhaps, you know, that was my thought at the time. I'm not really sure what Lewis's issue is, but at the time I was like, I'm not working for this fool. He don't like women. He thinks he, he's got some sort of ego thing going on that I'm just I'm not going to do it. And I know he's going to, and I know at the end of the day, I'm going to be screwed. So I might as well just cut it right now and just keep moving. So that's, that's the infamous club lonely. And then, so six months later, or maybe to answer the second part of your question, six months or so, I don't remember how long, or maybe a year later, Save My Life came out and he called me back. And um, I said, well, I'll, you, don't even talk to me for like, I, I need a thousand dollars just to come. <laughs> which is no money you know I mean it wasn't a lot of money but um it was just the point you know so we kind of went through that but at that point I think that um he had kind of ruined his own relationship with the, the record company with his demands and whatever else it was that he was doing and that was the end of pretty much Little Lewis as an artist um you know he did he did a couple other records which you know obviously you know, not taken away from the brother's creativity. He definitely has that, but um, he just didn't have what it took. And then I just went on and kept making records. So I was like, you know, what I do will show up because I can, I can replicate it. And so, you know, and so now when you look at that record, anyway, you look at it, what was once Little Lewis in the world is now Little Lewis Creature and Jimmy Cardwell, which must kill him, but oh, well. <laughs> Your your debut album was titled "The World Is Full of Trouble." What mm -hmm. inspired that name and the, and the songs on that record? Um, the world is full of trouble. Well, I think much like the times we are in right now, um, we were we were in the midst of an AIDS crisis, you know, and queer people, um, gay men were dying, black people were dying, you know, um, people were dying in the streets. Um, there was a lot going on as far as you know the recession. I think. Um, the world was full of trouble. There were just a lot of troubling things happening. And this was just my observation of that. I think I had gone back to um, selling books on the street at that point. I was selling books at St. Mark's and 8th Street um, and uh, Second Avenue. You know, if you know that whole area at the time was a, a big mecca for books. So um, we were selling books. My partner and I were selling books on the street with the aim of opening a bookstore, which we ultimately did in Hoboken. And while I was out in the street, um, my cousin died of AIDS, who was like a big shock because it was a female 
Um, I didn't know that she was a drug user. Like she had a sister who, who really had a drug problem and, you know, obviously died, not obviously, but she died much later. And this person just kind of like got caught up and got caught with that first wave. Remember it was like COVID, you know, the first wave was like swift and crazy. So um, I wrote Killing Time for, for that, um, you know, and I just think the songs reflected just how I was feeling, you know, and that's kind of how I try to keep it always. Like, what are my observations of the world? What's happening and how, how can I reflect that in a way that other people can, you know, experience that? And I think, you know, a lot of people um, go to the dance floor, you know, I think, was it Anaya who said, I take my problems to the dance floor? Um, you know, but that's that's what it is, you know, so I wanted to make sure that even though I was writing songs for the dance floor, that we weren't still just losing the fact that this, you know, dance is a cathartic thing. It's a spiritual thing. What they say house is a spiritual thing. Right. So we can't just talk about positive, uplifting, you know, just those kind of things, because we don't always feel that sometimes we need the blues, you know, to, to get things out of our system. We, we need to purge that. We need to feel it. We need to go through it. And what better place to do that, you know, than a hot, sweaty, dark, anonymous kind of vibe. And that's that's where that was. Building a career as a singer, what would you do differently today if you had a chance to start over? <sighs> well, I probably... I, I mean, the singing part, I wouldn't change. What I would change is my business part. Let's put it like that. Um, I really leaned heavily on what I thought were experts to guide me. Um, and part of the reason, and we'll talk about this later, um, that I became an attorney was I had leaned on my attorneys or people that I had hired to represent me in situations that I thought were um going to be beneficial to me and what I found out was is that you know boilerplate is probably the worst phrase anyone ever wants to hear when negotiating a contract because you're convinced that um what you're doing because everyone else is doing that's the only option you have and um what I would do is I would I would know more about my business before going into such a a business that can have such a not only a financial impact but also a spiritual impact on your life. What most people don't realize as an artist is that your work or people who are not artists, let's put it like this, your work is, is, is tied to something that is a commodity, right? And as a commodity, it has value. And then at the same time that people tell you that you have value in your artistry, they tell you that that value is worthless or they take away your value by undermining that with these contracts. Um, and I learned that lesson early enough, but I didn't realize the power that I had or that we collectively have in being able to understand and negotiate, you know, the first two pages or to give you everything and the next 40 or to take it away. So that's, that's the advice that I would give to myself is to really, you know, vet people that are around you, you know, because Another thing I realized was that, you know, a lot of people that own record labels are lawyers. So how do you how do you have equal, you know, how do you have an equal position with people who not only know contracts and how that works, but also are embedded in a system that is, you know, they say they have all the risk, but it's like, well, you don't have all the risk because I risked, I risked, you know, my my time, my investment, my this. Um, and and practice and you know equipment and all this other stuff that go into getting me to this place that I can hand you a finished product that you like and you say you take all the risks so therefore you should reap all the rewards when the rewards come generally okay if you take risk the reward should come after your risk has been rewarded right so if I invest in your company you recoup whatever expenses then after that we should share at least proportionately in the spoils. And so, you know, when you look at artists who are, are, are addicts or they have other issues, um, you know, a lot of times it's because their spirit's broken because you put, you invest into something that is a God given talent that somebody gave God gave to you and that you've nurtured or somebody poured into after the fact. And then you're, you're lauded and you're, you know, you're uplifted and they put you in pretty dresses and they put you in front of cameras and, you know, they show you this 
otherworldly type situation. And then, you know, as soon as you think, okay, well now I'm gonna get paid or whatever, the rug is pulled from me. And then you realize that you're trapped because now you're contractually obligated to do, you know, to continue to work in under these circumstances, you know, which is basically a situation of working under duress. So how could you possibly have that exuberance or that joy or that drive to, you know, continue to be an artist when, you know, the incentive for doing so is taken away. What effect has house music scene had for the LGBTQ movement? How would you compare that with hip hop or like Beyonce's pop R&B? Hmm, for the movement. I don't know if it's affected the movement in any kind of way. I mean, on the real, I mean, it's been a place for people to to release, you know, the tension. It's probably been for those behind the scenes that were LGBT. It's it's helped them to prosper in some kind of way. But as far as the movement for, I mean, you mean like civil rights? How's that connected or culturally or whatever? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah definitely. I and if you look at the history of house music, which comes out of disco, right? That was very gay, <laughs> very gay. They're very popular and very whatever. And that sparked a, a backlash, right? The disco sucks movement and, you know, this whole kind of underground thing, which has happened. You've had, of course, a couple of records, which are, you know, I, I was born this way, original Carl B and then the Lady Gaga, you know, kind of um, version of that. Um... I would say it's been a soundtrack, a soundtrack to what people think is the LGBTQ movement. I don't think that it's it's been that influential in moving mountains or changing anything from a, a social perspective. I think that it's been relevant just culturally in the overall arching, you know, thing of music because I think it was probably the biggest genre where LGBT. Q plus people have been able to express themselves. Um, and I think that that's obviously important to music and the evolution of music in general. But I don't think that 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 the whole LGBT um, movement has really benefited from it that much. I think that, you know, anytime you put a queer person uh, to be a creative person, you're going to get something creative and you're going to have something that will obviously influence greater culture, um, you know, Beyonce, um, you know, brought a lot of attention to house music with when she did her dance music album, it was the Renaissance album, and caused a lot of controversy within, you know, the community because, you know, the straight people were like, well, wait a minute, hold up. Your, your gay uncle wasn't the only one at the party. And you, you know what I mean? So in so many ways, I think the story, like everything has become kind of, led, you know, it's become this like urban legend of, you know, just this gay culture. And there are some icons. I mean, obviously Frankie Knuckles is a gay, was a gay man and one of the biggest progenitors of house music, you know, Ron Hardy. I mean, there were people within the community who are gay, um, who were big people in the scene, but, you know, so equally as David Morales is a straight man, you know, so equally Marshall Jefferson. Um, that, is it Jefferson, Mar Marshall? You know, I'm getting it wrong, move your body. Um, you know, just plenty of people um, that that contributed to it. I, and I think overall, I think as a genre, um, I think house music has just been a, a music for freedom, period, you know, for expression, period. And I think that that's important. And I think it coincided, obviously, with, you know, the AIDS epidemic, with this whole backlash, with all civil rights and all of these sexual gender norms i think it was just kind of like the music at the time where and and if you think of it in juxtaposition to hip-hop you know there was hip house at one point you know they were not really separated in until they got separated because you know hip hip-hop became this kind of like epitome of masculinity you know and hyper masculinity really um which we are now seeing is maybe a farce <laughs> um you know and then you had house and dance music is being like the gay music, but, you know, soundtrack to a movement. Yeah. Um, pushing the movement forward. Maybe. Before 2000, New York was a center 
some would say the center for house music and electronic dance music in general. Mm -hmm. What happened in the last 25 years? Well, I think Giuliani's, um, you know, when, when Giuliani came into office and had this whole culture of, um, what was it? What did they call it? You know, it was some sort of liberty. I can't remember. Yeah, the cabaret laws, like basically yeah, dancing. Thing. Oh, it was like, you know, public interest to to keep the quality. Oh, it was quality of life. Oh, right? life. Yes, yes, yes. Quality of life laws basically was kind of a misnomer for basically, we don't shut your ass down laws. Um, you know, we were gentrifying the city from this gritty kind of, you know, economic um, hole that it was in. And so they wanted to clean up the image and the the whole, um, you know, like the, the whole city was going to go from burnt out and busted to this gleaming Gotham city. And he was, you know, kind of at the center of that. So yeah, cabaret laws had been on the books for hundred, a hundred years, at least, you know, no dancing, whatever. And there was all proliferate, proliferation of underground clubs and uh, lots of things were going on. Then you had the drug thing that was kind of hand in, you know, they were all, it was all kind of tied together with the whole pedication, the ecstasy, cocaine, you know, all of that, the whole crack thing was going on. So um, you know, it was like a tale of two cities. You had a beautiful, vibrant culture that was multiracial, multigendered, you know, polyamorous, whatever you want to call it. People were just coming out dancing. Youth, creative people were doing a lot of really creative things, changing the world in their own way. And they were like, no, nah, these urban children need to shut it down. We're not having this. Um, and urban, you know, was mostly black and brown and Latino and Asian. But, you know, it was not just that. It was all kids. You know, it was just the cool kids who were probably the outcasts, you know, were really um, in the middle of just a time where you were just creating, whether it was clothing, art, music, um, everything, you know, and it was on the streets and everywhere. And yeah, they just shut it down. And then, you know, 9-11 happened, which was also a huge like turning point. Um, you know, the energy just changed. You can't have, you know, a city that was kind of thriving and, and doing all of these things just implode on itself and so many people die. Um, you know, there was just, there was, it was just like a downer type, type of period. People moved out, some people, you know, cause people came to New York just like they're doing now. Um, they came to New York to be part of something and then it was scary to live here, you know? So in that, in that vacuum, you know, we got uh, the downtown cultural, you know, cre coalition and things like that, which were once again curated to bring life back into the city from a cultural perspective. But, um, you know, so it wasn't, re it was very highbrow, wasn't representing the streets anymore. And it's ironic because I had gone back to school and um, I had a professor who was, she was like, you should definitely get, you know, your master's in, 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 in uh, public administration so you can work in the arts. We need people like you. And I was like, what? I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, yes, but no, but and I was like, no, I'm not doing that. But, you know, I mean, that's what happened. We, we were kind of the mecca for that. And again, that jump off, you know, because remember London had taken off as well. Tokyo, Japanese. I mean, we were just bouncing all over the place from New York to London, New York to Manchester, New York to Glasgow, you know, Italy. I mean, I remember being on a, on a plane at one point um, going out of winter music conference. Um, and literally like, every, there were like 40 of us on this plane. We went straight from, from New York to Riccione, right? So on this plane, let me just tell you at the time how deep the culture was that we were really kind of spreading the, the love and then Italo House and you know, that kind of branched out of there. But on that plane was Terry Hunter, Barbara Tucker, Sandy B, myself, um, Morales. Um, oh my God. A couple other artists that I knew of from 8-Ball uh, were there, Can uh, Candice, Candy. I can't remember, but you know, it was like a ridiculous amount of Mike Dunn, I believe, um, who else was on that plane? But it was just like a crazy Chicago. I mean, you know, you can't negate Chicago because Chicago was in there from the beginning. We just, you know, we, we're New York, so we market better. We know how to make it pop. We're more, you know, Chicago's Midwestern. And although 
some of the baddest music and still to this day, I love going to Chicago because some of the best music is played there and comes out of there. It's not New York. It's still, you know, it's middle America. We are a New York City flash. Everybody knows about it. So I think to a certain extent, we stole the, we stole the spotlight, you know, because it is, it is what it is. You know, Atlanta ain't LA. LA is not Chicago. Chicago's not New York. We all have our own vibe, but you know, the marquee cities are going to get the attention. That's just the way it is. Um, and that's, that's what was happening. But, you know, of course, New York always being kind of the center of movements. That's, that's where, that's how it happened and what happened. What is underground dance music and do you identify with it? I would have to identify with it because that's where I came from. And I think that underground um, represents, you know, it's it's not necessarily a sound per se. It's more of an attitude, which is I'm going to create what I create. If it hits with you, that's great. If it doesn't hit with you, I have my I have I have a following. I have an audience. I have people that are into what I do. And I think um, I think you have to ride the line of under over. You know, like anything, you can't be so underground that you're so niche that you can't make a living and only, you know, 100 people know who you are. Then you're not really part of nothing. You just kind of a hobbyist, you know, um, and at the same time, you can't be so commercially minded that you lose the heart of what it is. Sometimes you are underground and what you do just kind of resonates in a pop manner and pop meaning popular or not you know, the other type, just bubblegum, whatever. Um, and yeah, I think as an artist, I always, you know, at the beginning of my career, I used to say that I wanted to be like Ella Fitzgerald with the discography that, you know, spoke for itself with a body of work that when I left this planet would speak for me in its breath, you know? So you can actually listen to all of my records, and some of them are great. Some of them, are, some of them, are, they are horrible. <laughs> if I don't say so myself, but I've always strived to be consistent in the fact that I am creating something of meaning, you know, generally, even if the meaning was just for my own personal, you know, financial gain. But when you look at, when you look at the body of work, in totality, you know, I have a lot of records. Sometimes I'd gotten to a point where I just stopped sending the records to the billboard charts. So I don't think, you know, so some records remained underground just because I ch didn't choose to do the whole package of remixes and, you know, really go for those accolades because I felt that at some point it, become, it had become meaningless. At the beginning of my career, billboard was an arbiter in a a representation of the best stuff, right? This is the best stuff that you have. And you kind of work to make sure that it, it worked for everybody, but you always had that core record, right? And then eventually it, it just diminished. Like I just felt that the importance of it diminished. It wasn't helping me to tour. It wasn't helping me in my recognition. It was just paper and a number on a page. So um, I personally chose to just stop playing the game and just create music. And I think that that's, not think. I mean, obviously, that's where I'm at now because I'm not really 100% into music anymore. It's not my number one goal in life. Um, I'm a musician and will be so till I die. But that's it. Underground is there. Who's your favorite DJ? Who's your favorite producer? Who's your favorite DJ slash producer and why? Okay, so that's a broad question. You kind of left that open. You kind of left that open ended. You mean in dance music or just period? Period. Right. So give them to feed me one at a time. What was my favorite? Who? Who's your favorite DJ? Favorite DJ. For me to dance to? Hmm. I don't really have a favorite DJ. I used to love listening to Frankie um, just because. He always played such beautiful tunes, um, you know, as, as far as that was concerned. And his his ability to just play was always seamless and on point. Um, I love, I mean, I, I love the, I mean, I love the old heads. I mean, Tony Humphreys is genius. Um, Louis, when Louis's not just playing Louis records, I love him. <laughs> um, David Morales, another genius, you know, but David has his moments where he goes into David land. 
So sometimes he loses me, but I mean, these are all, I think I, I think that my favorite DJs are, are usually producers as well. And I think the reason for that is they have a different understanding of music, a deeper understanding of music. Oh, and I do love Bill Coleman as a DJ. And I love him because of his just absolutely like ridiculous understanding of music and, and just the, all genres. So clearly I named everybody. <laughs> Let's talk about reunion parties, the Loft and Paradise Garage. Uh huh. What do these legacies mean today? I wouldn't know because I, I don't go to those. No, no idea. I was too young. I mean, number one, I did go to loft parties back in the day. Didn't know I was there because I really was at the cusp of that age wise. Um, so I, I ended up in places, you know, and didn't even know and didn't have any real significance for me. I think, I mean, from what I've heard, let's put it like this. What I see from other people's comments are that I think they have a place like anything to bring people together that, you know, used to party on a weekly basis and have a shared sense of community. I probably would say that they're they're done too often. You're one of the few artists that actually has their masters, got their masters back. Tell us the eight ball records journey. <laughs> um, okay, well, two things. So first, first, the first road to me getting my masters back occurred when my first statement came, right? So you know, time makes everything a little fuzzy. So I don't want to be inaccurate, but I'll give a general overview. I got my first, I got my first um, royalty statement and I was, you know, I knew what kind of numbers I was doing and they were quite significant because remember at that time you actually sold records and records were, you know, significant in the amount of money that was um, paid and the royalty was, you know, quite significant. And I went and I looked at this statement and I was like, number one, math ain't math, right? I feel that the numbers that are, are not actually representative of what I'm doing on an international basis because I remember Alex saying to me, you know, Joy, um, you're not really selling, you know, records. And I said, that's really odd, Alex, because when I'm traveling to 30 countries this year, Every time I go to a record store, there seem to be records there and people seem they are on charts and they're doing all these other things. And how do you not sell records and end up, you remember, we weren't playing on the radio. So how am I not selling records, but yet I'm touring in, you know, I'm in Korea or I'm on some compilation because I picked it every time I go to this country, I go to the record store and see what's happening and I'm licensed. And oh, by the way, here's the record, you know? So I was like, this is bullshit. So, you know, I started digging into my contract and I decided, you know, there's, there's always like that out clause, you know, we have the right of first refusal, you know, to pick up the option, blah, blah, blah. Right. So I was like, okay, this is not going to work for me because I already see that this is, this is, here we go again. You know, this is, this is the crazy part. So I, um, I realized that I had to perform two albums, right? The first two albums needed to be done, but by, I guess, a certain date, um, if I had produced the first album and then within that time frame, within the year or whatever I was supposed to do, I produced the next album, they only had X amount of days in order for them to pick up my option, right? So, you know, I just did what I did when I was at the Apollo. I just sat and waited. Went about my business produced every record that I needed to do. And you know, I was, again, I produced albums because I figured I'm not going to do singles. I'm going to do an album and then you pick singles off of my album. So that was always my mindset, not doing, we're not going to sit here and do 400 singles. And, you know, we just keep that, that train moving without, you know, any parameters on it. So sure enough, the day came that I had already produced and sent in my next album or was in process and it was already on the release schedule. And um, I sent them a letter. I said, well, gentlemen, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been wonderful. I'm just letting you know that um, I'm not exercising the next, uh, you, you failed to exercise the next option. So therefore I'm giving you notice that I will be moving on. <laughs> so that didn't go too well, but I was like, I don't care. 
you know, this is what it is. We're going to, we have a new art record. We want to work, work this record. And we did. And I think we ended up with uh, two number ones off of that record as well as a couple of top tens. So we worked the four singles. We'd already been going through Warner Brothers. And I know people would probably think that I have cut off my nose to spite my face, you know, several times in my career. And perhaps I have, but um, I never wanted to be a star more than I wanted to be an artist. And I think the worst thing for me was not being able to do what I wanted to do with my craft, which was to perform. So subsequently, um, a good friend who became a good friend, and I just told her this the other day, Carrie Cisneros um, was working in, I don't know if she was a bookkeeper or accounting secretary, I don't know what it was, but she had access to, um, you know, what was on the computers. And she, you know, she called me and she said, hey girl, um, you know, here's your statements or whatever. Um, she gave me, she just gave me some information that pertained to my accounts. And what I had realized was um, there were two sets of books. The books that were for the artists and the books that were, you know, the actual income coming from these multiple streams. Because remember, um, I was being licensed in Germany, France, Italy, Japan, um, other parts of Asia, um, and probably other places, Netherlands, you know, whatever. So in major markets, like multiple times you know we had a single here we had a european release whatever and that was common so um again i waited till i got my statement and then i said well look, look here this says this and this is what you sent me so there's two ways we can we can do this and oh before that i actually we were on um during the splash so i think we were on 16th or 17th street at the time right off of sixth avenue that's where the office had moved to above that bar so one day I just walk in and I take, I literally walked in with a hand truck and I just <laughs> loaded all my two inch reels. I just stacked them up and I took one of the interns. I was like, you, come here. And I grabbed all my shit and I put them on that and I just walked out of the office with them. I didn't even take, and I was stupid because I didn't take the remixes. I didn't know at the time, you know, you know what you know until you don't know what you don't know. So I didn't take the DATs because remember the digital audio tapes. I didn't take the remixes because I wasn't, I didn't know about derivative rights at that time, but I took all the original masters because like, well, my voice is on the original masters. I, you know, everything's a remix anyway, so who cares? And I walked the bitches right out and I took them straight to my grandmother's house because I knew nobody would ever be able to not, you know, you just don't know people. It's like nobody ever would find them there. So I walked out first with all my masters, physically had them in my hand. And then second, I said to Alex, um, yeah, I'm going to sue you. I didn't tell him. I mean, I, I literally went and got some attorneys. And um, I don't know if I should say it, but let, let's just say somebody within the record company who was a higher up would come into the company at that point. Kind of was like, well, you know, here's some lawyers you can, I'll give you, you know, recommendation for these litigators. And um, I got a job working as a waitress to pay my attorneys. And at that time I had called up all of the other artists that were on the label. And I said, listen, I'm going to sue. If you join me, we can share the expenses and do it as a one joint action. Right. And, um, uh, everybody's, oh, no. I mean, I literally called grown ass men who, you know, strong ass men and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, oh no, Alex is whatever, blah, blah, blah. you know, I can't, whatever. And I was like, I'm doing this shit. I don't care. If I have to scrub floors, I'm getting my shit back. So I did that. I worked for, I think, uh, six months. And then, you know, I tell you, God is good all the time. And then I got called to do a Japanese tour. Um, it was like 75 dates. So that was, I was like, perfect. Boop. I'm out of this bullshit job. You know, the cash money job. I was working my butt off, but paying my lawyers. And um, I remember I had threatened Alex with I, I went to bankruptcy court i remember now so he said oh we're bankrupt i you know i can't pay you nothing i can't do anything and this is all kind of stream of consciousness so it's not in order but i went to the bankruptcy courts and i was like okay well if he filed for bankruptcy there's gotta be a filing symbol it's a matter of public record so you know my legal mind is still you know it's there i don't really know what i'm doing but i was like i know some things and this just don't sit right with me so i went to the bankruptcy court and i looked for 
you know, Shakedown. Shakedown Records was the DBA, was the name of the company, by the way. Shakedown Records, LLC. Just think about that. And then secondarily, 8-Ball. That's some shady shit. <laughs> so I went and I looked and there was no, there was nothing on record. So I said, if you don't give me my shit back, I'm going to let every creditor out there that you have done business with know that you, in fact, are not bankrupt. You're just shysty. And so I think probably because we had been going back and forth and he was just running up my legal bills, basically. So I was like, OK, we can't keep doing this. So I sent him that letter and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let every, everybody know what you're up to and that now your creditors can come to, for you because you're LLC. But I also knew that if you were using the LLC just as a shield not to do things and you were just being, you know, crazy, you, you know, you can pierce the seal, the corporate veil. So I think probably two weeks after that, he saw, he didn't give me my money. That was, that was it. Like I wasn't going to get that, but um, in consideration for $1, I got, I got all my classic stuff back, those two albums. And that's how I built upon that. Um, but that's, that's how I got away from April records. I just called them. Basically, I just called them on their shit. It's like, you cannot, and this was my premise and this has always been my thing. One, no one's going to ever make more money off of me than me, percentage-wise, off of my talent. I'm just not down for that unless I want to, right, freely and of my own free will. Two, if I see that you're taking advantage of me, we're not going to do both. You keep my money and you keep my stuff. So either you give me my money and you can gladly have what we agreed upon or you're going to give my shit back and I'll handle it from here. And that's what happened. So that was, that's, that's how that ended and how I got the master's back. So the next thing is what I did with it. If you want to hear that story. I was going to say, yeah. Tell us what you did with it. <laughs> so um, that was, that was like 1999, I think, something like that. So I set up a new company and I immediately went out and got a publishing and admin deal. Right. So I was like, okay, I need something that's going to help me collect on what's, floating out in the world. So I got an admin deal with, um, I think it was, was it Bug Music? Yeah, it was Bug Music, right? So, but I was already, I already had like some good shit going on in Japan. So I signed a separate deal with Sony in Japan. So I was like, nah, I'm gonna deal with Sony to let Sony deal with what they do because I knew Japanese companies, they pay. They're, you know, they're, they're pretty, you know, straightforward with that. If they're skimming off the top, well, they do, but you're still getting paid a significant amount. So I did that. And then um, this was when MP3s were just starting to happen around 2004. So I had used my um, ASCAP connections, you know, because at the time I had started with BMI to move to ASCAP because they, I was told they paid dance music better, especially, you know, they had these bonuses and whatever. So I was using my connections to go to all these conferences that were important at the time, Billboard, um, any ASCAP conferences, Grammy in the school. So, you know, my NARIS membership. Um, and of course I went to music conference at that time was still influential. So I would just go out and see what was happening. And I started licensing deals and doing other stuff and, I had ended up um, licensing my next album with um, Nal Davis, not Nal Davis. Why am I saying that? That's, that's Clive Davis, Nal Rogers. Nal Rogers, <laughs> started with Clive Davis on that. Nal Rogers had a distribution, um, had a company. And so I ended up pushing my first solo album through him. Um, and that's that was through Warner Brothers. And then I just kept parlaying that. But ultimately, I signed um, my first big MP3 deal I still have to this day with The Orchard. So The Orchard, which was acquired by Sony um, some maybe a couple of years ago, I had been with them since the beginning. And I literally made like $4 a year for like the first five years, like no money. But I was like one of the first independent labels to be on Apple Music because I had that tie in. So I just bided my time, you know, I, I, I always read a lot. So I had read an article in the Wall Street Journal about MP3 and I was like, ooh, this is coming. And everybody was like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. I was like, okay, I'll just wait. Technology, whenever there's something that's that big, the technology is coming. You just, you just don't know when it's gonna pop or how it's gonna work, but that's what I did. So fast forward, I was able to um, license and sell part of my catalog um, 
for a you know a nice chunk of money, which you know I had calculated that it would take me based upon you know how these things were working that I would probably probably take me thirty years to make that amount of money. So I took the payday and then I started another company the day after I did that I signed with BMG and um, you know that's what I did. So I just kept making new deals like you know one deal inspired make another deal. So the funny thing about my publishing was, is that Bug Music, who had had my uh, music, I said, well, it's time to renew my uh, licensing. And they were like, well, your catalog is only, you know, worth blah, blah, this, that, and the other thing. So meanwhile, BMG is over here, BMG Chrysalis. Um, I had a, I had someone who had helped me to, you know, see what they thought. So they were the ones that offered me this beautiful deal. And then maybe six months after my deal, they bought Bug. <laughs> so I was like, suckers, you still work for me. And um, I took the bag home. So that was that. But yeah, you know, par parlayed that master's um, into another, uh, you know, gave me new life. It actually got me paid for the music. Was it, you know, and then in aggregate, the, the amount of time, I made obviously the money that I would have never made with eight ball back 20 fold, maybe more, probably more because I'm still getting paid. So, um, you know, had I not made that decision and not done that, um, you know, I'd be in the predicament like a lot of people, but, you know, they would have sold me to somebody else inevitably because I'm part of, you know, whatever. And I would have never probably seen another dime from it, even though my music plays all over the world to this day. Wow. I have like 30 other questions, but we're going to say that for a part two. Um, okay. I want to end with, talk to us about your journey to becoming an attorney. What inspired that? And tell us about that journey. Um, the journey to become an attorney started again when I was a kid. Um, you know, I mean, I knew that I wanted to be a musician, but I didn't know what that would entail. And I was always a good student, you know, um, as a kid, I was a straight A student, except in math. Um, and I love to read and I really have this innate um, sense of, of feeling like injustice, you know, I'm a Libra. So, you know, the one thing that really gets my goat makes me want to like, just get fired up is when I sense that there's some sort of injustice happening. Um, and I don't know, you know, first time I, I had dealt with, again, you know, my first big foray into big business was I had to fight a lawyer, you know, it was Percy Sutton, <laughs> Percy, the legendary Percy Sutton. I'm 18, 19 years old. He offers me a contract because I'm up at the Apollo and he tells me, uh, yeah, that's not negotiable. So on my way down on the A train back to NYU, because I'm a freshman in school, I was like, y'all don't even care enough to make sure that the contract I had, you didn't erase the last guy's name on it. So non-negotiable, it's not my contract. That was first point. So I read it, redlined it, you know, wrote it all the way down. I was like, I ain't signing this. I'm just not doing it. So um, I just, I told you, I, I play the waiting game very well. So I just waited out the period in which they had an option for me. I said, well, they have a one-year option on my management because that's what you had to sign in order to, to actually even get on the stage to do amateur night. I was like, I'm in school. I'm a freshman. I don't care. I'm going to be in school for another three years. It doesn't matter to me if they want to manage me for a year. Go right ahead. So that was the first thing. So when I graduated, um, I didn't actually graduate. I faux graduated because my last semester of college, I had a, a, a record deal with Arista Records. So I was kind of half going to school during the day and half not. And then I had one course where my teacher um, basically left. So I ended up losing the entire semester for, you know, crazy reasons, right? So when I went back to school at 38 to, to actually finish that degree that last semester ended up I had to take a whole year um i said i'm gonna go into law like i don't really know what's gonna happen with me with music but i'd always felt like the lawyers always had the upper hand with everything you know and as you well know someone who's you know in compliance the law is everything it's an its hand is in everything criminally civilly etc and people think it's about criminal law but Really, civil law is 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 where it all happens, or constitutional law. So, um, 
that time I got hooked up with someone who said, nah, you don't want to spend a hundred thousand dollars to go, you know, to law school, let's go trade stocks. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. Make some money. And that's what I did. So I didn't do it that time. So um, I had another ex that just took up way too much of my time. So I wasn't able to pursue it then, but it always kind of sat in the back burner. Like this is something that I'm interested in. I was always interested in dissecting contracts, understanding what you know, what the law means to us individually and collectively. And so finally, um, during COVID, my current wife um, was like, why haven't you done it? Like, you know, what are you going to do next? And I was like, I don't know, I have this nonprofit. And she was like, girl, take the, L take the LSAT and see what happens. So that was like Thanksgiving of like 2020, right? And, you know, the world's basically is open, but not really. So I said, oh, shit, if I don't take this in the next five weeks, I'm going to have to wait another year. So we went to Barnes and Noble, got me two, two LSAT prep books, studied for five weeks, took the LSAT, applied to, I think, four schools, got waitlisted for two, got into two, reject five, got rejected from one. And next thing you know, I'm enrolled full time at FAMU Law, doing my thing, and now I've published a paper um, on voting rights. I just wrote another paper and I work for legal aid doing some civil, you know, civil rights, human rights stuff. And that's where I'm at. You know, I, I feel that economic justice ultimately is the number one thing. And as an artist, as we talked about before, if we are not being fairly represented in the things that we create, if we are being taken advantage of, and, and, we've, and it's been for millennium, you know, most most creations that are any import that are long long standing, you know, come from people of color, and yet our equity share in that is very small. So I feel that it's extremely important to have people like me who understand what what it is to um, you know be in the trenches and sit at those tables because you know percentage wise we're very small within the profession, and to use that knowledge and activism to to really kind of you know help us to, to move ahead in this world because if, if we're not there we don't know and if we are there we need to tell what we know and I think that's 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 how I got here so we'll see how it works out <laughs> you know but the plan is is to be as tenacious and um you know as driven as I've been with my music career and still make music why should why stop I mean I love music and it's a gift that I have so I'm going to do both. I'm just going to pursue the other side more as, as my, my, my next level of work and the other becomes my joy. And the last question for this part one, what advice do you have for the next generation? <laughs> that, again, when, when you're asking me these loaded questions, um, in what context? Like, what you mean? In my, in oh, sorry. So, so, so like <laughs> the next, oh, so, sorry, I'll, I'll clarify. So, the next um the the 19 year old person that wants to follow in, in Joy Cardwell's footsteps has a great voice, has persona and charisma, and mm -hmm. wants to, you know, be a star house music singer. What what advice would you give him or her? Um, I think the first thing that I would tell them is to really be sure that they want to do music, you know, because it can be a, a great pleasure and it can be a great heartache make sure that you have a, a strong constitution you know for for the business because it's the business that is the hardest aspect of it creativity is something that you're born with you know so if you have the, you have to have drive like only you can know if you actually have what it takes to be driven enough to do it because talent is great. I mean, but we all know that, you know, talent alone will not get you there and it won't keep you there. Um, and sometimes people that are less talented than you naturally have the other aspects of it, right? So you've got to be a whole person. And that means that if you're going to be, you know, dance music in particular is centered around spaces that are not necessarily healthy for the creators or or even the participants, right? So you got to get your mind right. You need to be very much in tune with your body, with your spirituality. You need to be grounded um, financially and otherwise. You need to know, you know, that people around you may not always be looking out for your greater good. And you need to learn your, learn your business because knowing your business will be the key to making sure that whatever you do on the creative tip, 
you have some ownership in that. And I don't mean, you know, that you have to own it outright because that unless you're well financed, that never happens. Um, but, you know, having enough knowledge to be able to make decisions that you can live with and evolve with, you know, over time. So be a whole person first and, and understand that that's what it entails, not only for your financial and artistic success, but for your person's success. Um, and, and also know that this is a, it's a hard road, you know, it is show business. So what you see is not necessarily what it is. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Thank you. And, uh, it's so good to see you as always. All right, babe. All right. Have a good day.